today we want to engage in a very interesting study, a study I hope that will captivate you and interest you, and a study with which you will find, in which you will find some very practical looks at what the scriptures have to say about the life that we live and the faith that we have, and not only that, but how the Lord speaks to us in his word about following Jesus. I'm Pastor Ken Larson, and I'm with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, and we come to you in this way as often as you want to visit us there, as often as you want to see what the Lord has done and what he promises to still do for his believers. You can take our invitation to worship personally Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 in person or at trinitydelray.org slash live. I found it easier to get there simply by going to YouTube and subscribing to trinitydelray.org and then all the videos are lined up there for you. The videos of worship and the videos for this Bible study. This Bible study which we record on Saturday. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being interested in the Holy Scriptures enough to study his word. All right. The question before us this time, as we enter a new topic, where is help when the culture shocks, the culture shocks that in inevitably come upon us, uh, threaten our faith or the practice of our faith? Sometimes we feel uh, threatened and bothered by what is going on in the world. And I want to see if the, the Lord can render some aid to our souls, uh, our thinking, uh, the parts of us that say, Lord, what's going on here? And I wanna do that by beginning with a portion of Psalm 78. I have celebrated Psalm 78 with you many times. It's a Psalm that rehearses what the Lord has done what the Lord has done. Look at the words here in the first seven verses of Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed the law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell and arise and tell to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Well, what do you think about that Psalm, those, those verses? Uh, look at them with your eyes and with your heart. <laughs> right. Center when you look upon the idea of teaching and telling. Things we have heard, we will not hide, but tell. And, and, and we're supposed to tell it to the children so that it continues on forever, you know? Yes. You keep telling the next generation. Right. And the that is a purpose clause. The reason you teach is so that the next generation would know what God has said, his testimony, his law, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. This has been going on since God had, had set up the idea of putting teachers as those people that, can, that hold God's word, people that have been held responsible for it. 
and also in Deuteronomy 6, as we shall see, where he commands the fathers to teach the children. The fathers to teach their children. Oh, what a different world it would be if the fathers would teach their children, would sit down with them. Yeah, well, I think too, yeah, I think too much of uh, Christian education as well as general education from the time our youngsters are born, sadly, going to daycare centers, we are turning over the education of our, or we have turned over the education of our children to others whom we don't even know what their values are in some cases, sometimes, you know, if, yeah. uh, we just, we just don't know what they're getting. And sometimes we think they might be getting good values in Christian education. I mean, we really have to be vigilant in uh, um, what's being taught at all times. Absolutely. And that's why many of our congregations, I can't give you a number today, have started daycare centers in which the teachers, we have one right out here at Epiphany Lutheran on, uh, I used to call it, it used to be Jubilee, now it's Lions Road. And uh, Pastor Fountain, my good friend, was pastor there for 30 years. And they established a daycare center and built a nice building and have Christian teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, I think our, our preschool takes uh, youngsters now up uh, at the age of one, which is pretty young. Uh, we don't take newborns yet, but we take them at one. And I remember my, uh, my Christian sister, Emmy Lang, who's retired and was a teacher there, uh, while she was working part-time this year, she no longer is. She was reading stories to these little ones. Uh, she was working in the library and coming in and reading, you know, stories to these little ones and starting starting uh, education from there. Good idea, absolutely. Anyone else want to weigh in on? This I do, call? Pastor Christine. Um, <clears throat> so teaching is one thing, but children watch what you do. Oh yes. That's where the problem is because you can teach Christianity and then not act it. And I think children know the difference and they, uh, it's just a comment. No, a great, great example. Uh, there was a book that I read when we first had children and it was about lectures uh, I never heard. <laughs> the lectures were taught by example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard work at, at times. All right. Well, let's go on and find out what application this is going to have. I'm going to talk about uh, some keys and one particular key in particular. Everybody knows that keys are for unlocking as well as for locking. I want right. to look at a, at a particular key to work on what we all agree is a problem. And that is, can we find a key to help us bear up because things are changing. There is a constant pressure from the culture to bend to their way of thinking and speaking and acting. I, if you'd watch the news day after day and month after month and year after year, you know that things are not right. There is a deep set anxiety in even in God's people that things really need to change. And anyone, uh, I'm not speaking about the uh, election, that's just one particle in the grand sway of behaviors that are contrary uh, to God's word. And we, we have trouble bearing up on this, under this pressure to, to fold in, to, to, to give in uh, to this constant pressure from the culture shocks that we know. Can you name some of them? Immorality. Immorality in right. particular. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking too of, of um, private business and small business being able to want to control their own businesses or, uh, or being um, persecuted uh, where we've seen cases in the past with uh, bakeries who uh, 
you know, choose their clients and do not want to acknowledge certain types of marriages and those types of things. Also trying to, trying to, um, uh, follow their religious beliefs or, um, or I think in the case of even the healthcare, um, some companies do not feel, I think Hobby Lobby is one and the little sisters, was it that um, did not want to um, be responsible for providing um, the day after pill medication um, for abortion or um, even birth control pills uh, that some people do not believe in. Those types of things which re refer to life um, and issues. So those are all pressures that come from, you know, from the world and even from Christians who, you know, who believed certain ways they can put pressure even on these businesses sometimes. Things are changing. Do you know, there is a thing called the tyranny of the present, the tyranny of the present. And because we can't live except in the present moment and in these present years that we have lived, we tend to think that the only thing is our, the decades, the seven or eight decades or nine, if we're very strong, that decades that God gives us are the only decades that matter, that count. And to some extent, that is true because of the only time, that's the only time that we have any control over. I can't control anything about the day before I was born or the day after I die, in any great extent anyway, so, uh, well, except for the legacy of, of um, beliefs and property. All right. But I'm talking about the tyranny of the present that forgets, if you don't read scripture and you don't believe scripture, you forget or don't know that these things have been happening since the beginning of Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. Also, if you don't read history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You must know that the persecutions that we are su suffering under at the present time have been going on for a long time and will continue until the day that Christ returns. That's not pleasant news, but it is true, and I must tell you that. Yes. I must tell the world that these decades you have are not unique, though they seem so. Yeah, history repeats itself. It sure does, and that's why, and the reason is sin. So we have a culture shock. The Christians, with res resilience, want to have that toughness that Paul had when he wrote this. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> St. Paul did not write this. In fact, I don't have the author. Christians and their congregations are better able to bear up, survive, and even thrive under various social and cultural shocks when they are well taught, discipled, mm. grounded in their personal faith, and living in an ongoing relationship to Jesus Christ. Would you digest and comment on that with me, please? Better able to bear up and survive and thrive when they are well taught, discipled, and grounded in their personal faith and living in a relationship. What does bear up mean? Well, let's say that when I am buffeted or when something in society or culture wants me to bend to their way, I refuse. I have a strength of mind and spirit and character that says, I will not bend. It's a determination, a toughness, a resilience to bounce back. That's what it means to bear up. Thank you for asking. That was Joanne. I think a lot of people are confused um, about their ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. Say more words about that. Well, um, we can have a, a, a belief 
And and let's see, while this says the well-taught discipline grounded in their personal faith, which is great, but their ongoing relationship, maybe they're not carrying it through to um, present day uh, relationship to Jesus Christ. Okay, Again, good. Mm -hmm. Various other things. And this we could study. How, how do you promote uh, and keep an ongoing relationship? You, ha you, have, to, you have to be in the, in the word. Um, right. And, and there's many ways we know to do that through through participating of course in our in our church and congregation together as a group our, our, as we are right now in Bible study uh, individual devotions and those sorts of things but I think when we know when we know God number one is who is in command and in command of our life um, when we know the basic concept of right and wrong, which is something sounds very basic, but a lot of people do not know right and wrong and the truth in today's world, it's real easy to make those decisions of saying, no, I cannot do that because I do not believe in it because we know that according to in God's eyes, it is wrong. And so those decisions do not become bad. When you, you know, an example I think is, is lying. It's um, something that happens so much or the not telling the truth. And then it's like, if you tell one lie, then you've got to tell another lie and you end up telling another lie and you don't remember what the lie was and it goes on and on and on and snowballs. Uh, but when you know right and wrong, uh, it makes your, it really makes your life a whole lot less complicated. I can't find it either. Anna, do you know where it is? Where, what is? <laughs> oh, she's talking about something else. I'm having trouble with my video this morning, but I will fix it from now on uh, if it, if it does that. Uh, all right. Christians with resilience. Uh, bounce back. Uh, refuse to cave in and know that it's good that I stand. I have a place to stand on God's word because God's word will not disappoint me. God's word will never lie to me. Mm -hmm. It may be that I won't figure it out. That's a different thing. There's a difference between the perspicuity of scripture and the perspicacity of scripture. You go look those words up. <laughs> Perspicuity is, perspicuity is the clearness of scripture. Perspicacity yeah. has to do with my capacity to understand it and apply it. And there's a whole lesson in those two words that I won't do now. I think I've done it before in the classroom. Perspicuity is the clearness of scripture and perspicacity is my ability to understand it. Let's go on. Resilience, resilience, resilience. Is there any help? Well, if, I wouldn't ask that question if I didn't uh, expect that we would answer it. But here's another question I'm asking you. I really am asking you, how can we build this spiritual resilience so that we could withstand the shocks that come upon us from disease and divorce and death and drugs and other shocks to our lives? The four Ds, but I only put three of them in there, disease, divorce, death, and drugs that are shocks to our lives. How can we do that? Judy, you were already on to that, how? Well, if, when you know what God wants us to do, when we know what he wants us to do, um, we have to be obedient. And then, uh, you know, I heard Christine say, you have to practice it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be the example. You have to practice it over and over and over. and when you practice good habits, they stay with you. Just like if you practice bad habits, unfortunately, they stay with you and they're harder yeah. to get rid of. Hey, you got that. I heard Bobby's voice speak up. Did you have something to say, Bobby? He may have been speaking to someone in the room. All right. All right. Anybody else on how to build spiritual resilience? <sighs> I think of resiliency more in terms of asking questions and not being too rigid, in fact. But I think of resiliency in terms of overcoming challenges, but 
by, by taking in considerations of what is going on around us. That is, that and is, asking questions. Asking good questions. That's an excellent way to go about it. Sometimes yeah. people don't get the right answers because they're asking the wrong questions. Chris? Yeah. Well, I, I feel the underlying basis of any of all of this is your faith. And if you you if it's not strong, you're going to waver. And you've got to have that strong faith, which we get through studying and, and being in company of other people of faith. All right. Is there any help? How can we build spiritual resilience to bear up under the cultural shocks of unholy and threatening behavior? Maybe you've already answered that question. And I think I did. <laughs> All right. We're right. doing that right now as we study God's word. I really think we have to pray for discernment in that too, because oh. uh, even though we sometimes, we can easily go down the wrong path sometimes. Uh, so really paying for praying for that discernment, which is sometimes really hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. To make sure that we go down the you know the right path in understanding the culture that's going on around us. All right. Now, let me combine your answer uh, with Karen's. The asking the right questions. You're asking the questions about the culture to define what the problem really is, and then you're asking the question of the scriptures, mm -hmm. looking for help in and asking in prayer for discernment. Mm -hmm. about how can I apply God's word to what I am experiencing? Right. <laughs> I think what makes that so hard right now is that our country is polarized as maybe it's been this polarized before. I don't know. But in my lifetime, this is the most polarized I've ever seen. And I think it's because of, um, unfortunately, the way social media and information in order to ask those questions, our information is skewed depending on where we tune in. I mean, it's not like one news source <laughs> or one person speaking anymore in our culture. There's different views and different slants mm -hmm. and those- um, And different actions. Yeah. yeah we're, we're seeing uh, uh, a great deal of censorship and uh, cancellation of, uh, of thoughts and ideas right now that uh, are both good and bad that you know we may want to hear, which is uh, difficult, and those are create more problems as to how can we go about getting clear information. I think differently, Judy, is the problem we haven't had enough cancellation of information, and has uh, infected a lot of people. But that's my own opinion. Well, Karen, I want to speak to what you said about many sources and not knowing how and who to trust. When we were first watching television news in the 50s, there were three networks and each had a half an hour and minus commercials. You had your choice of one of the 20 minutes worth of news and an editor uh, in those stations and those networks decided what would be the news. And one of them at the end of the newscast would say, and that's the way it was, or that's the way it is. <laughs> well, that's part of the story. Um, I don't have complete answers to your, your implied question. In fact, well, let's go on to getting the help that we need. What do we Christians need when the decay of society's morals challenge our sense of right and wrong? What do we need? We need God's help. Um, I think the Psalms are, are good to read and Psalm 121 is pretty basic. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help. my help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Yep. That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. We need that. So we need the word and we need to pray about how to apply the word, how to understand the word to what we're doing and what we're thinking. We do not want to be conformed to the world. Romans 12 verse 1. 
but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's what we need, a renewing of our minds by the word of God. Now, that's not a shorthand, okay? I want to, to bring to you uh, today and in the following weeks, I never know when we start out on these little journeys how long we're going to be in it. I can always add 10 more slides, which is like saying 10 more tangents if we were in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. But I want to use my uh, <laughs> the spiritual discipline to stick to the word, unlocking <laughs> a word that can help us survive culture shock. And does anyone have a guess as to what that word is? I don't have any prizes to give today. <laughs> Faith. Faith is a good word. It's not the word I'm going to talk about. Forgiveness. That's a great word. At the center of Christianity. Give me the word that can help us survive the culture shocks. Trust. Trust. Uh, Redemption. Attention. Pardon? Redemption. Redemption. We have that. That's not the word I'm oh. going to drive it for a while. Uh, I think I, I happen to think trust is the problem because we become untrustworthy of the and, and that causes the the culture shock. Yeah. Because we we found out that we were lied to. Uh, righteousness. Yeah. 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 The word has been mentioned in uh, passing, but not, uh, we didn't oh. center on it. So I want you to, no more guesses. All right. <laughs> I love to play with you and it's a- That's okay. <laughs> it's not to hurt you, but no. to get your mind. It's kind of like when in third grade, the teacher said, now put your thinking caps on. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> yes, it stimulates our old brain cells. Yeah. But uh, take the word old out. <laughs> <laughs> I found out recently in reading about that, that it's not true that we lose so many brain cells that we are bereft of them, that we can create new brain cells and new connections. Old dogs can learn new tricks. That's correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there's the word. Can I? Hey, oh, can I push that Mm -hmm. You see wow. the word on the screen? Yeah. yeah. That's the word I want to unlock with you. Okay. Discipleship. Discipleship um, is the key because it has to do with discipline, but even more to the idea of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Teaching and learning. Discipleship. Is that a Bible word? Yes. Yeah. Derived from, just take the hip off. <laughs> disciples. And you have the disciples. Um, Pastor, may I enter? I wanted to, since you, you put the title of this uh, new program on, on how, how you are able, we all need this help right now, and how you are able to zero in on the current problems and, and help us. And You're asking I, me how I do that. <laughs> no, I commend you for doing it. Oh, thank you. Um, it has been bothering me. Um, the long story is, is that at one time, the, the circuit asked me to do a presentation. Hmm. And then Pastor Vince has asked me with the elders to, to do this. And I knew that you would be interested in the two mm -hmm. because of the, the things that are going on. But even if it were peaceful, I want to bring to you a reading in a little bit. Discipleship. Ever been discipled? Now think back over the entire history of your life and answer the question, have you ever been discipled? After. I think after confirmation, um, I think that was a, a, a discipleship learning. Excellent. When my mother read me um, Bible stories. Yes. Have you ever been discipled? 
few weeks ago, I talked to one of the elders and uh, he said he had been discipled and um, I didn't question it. But the next day he sent me the table of contents from a book that had been used when he was younger and the table of contents showed that he had indeed been discipled in a formal way, like our catechism, only it wasn't uh, Luther's small catechism. By whom were you discipled? I think even another Christian friend um, who lovingly sometimes corrects us is discipling us um, to get back in the, I, I, I'm back on that right path again because it's easy to get off, off course. So we need correction, you're saying? Yes, uh, our, Christian, our Christian friends who know the word and love the Lord. All right, so it's not always uh, sitting down in a classroom with a book open. It can be, and when you talk of them, when you walk by the way, that's Deuteronomy 6. Mm -hmm. And in ca that case, it was the Father. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that it's often the mothers who do the Bible studies and dad reads the newspaper, but we practiced in, when we had uh, small children to do it at the supper table. I've told you that before, that it was after the meal, but before the dessert. <laughs> yeah, they tend to stay at the table when you said, we'll have dessert after devotions. And then we opened little visits with God and, and that was about three minutes. All right, what does Jesus say in Matthew 28 that we are to do? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Is that the one? That's the one. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I, can not, I don't think that's right. You're close. Um, Jesus says, as you're going, it's a present part of the simple. It means something you're doing. As you're going along in life, as you're walking along the road of life, disciple. Who you're supposed to disciple? All nations. That means all peoples. All right. Baptizing and teaching. So this is what you are to do. Make disciples. The verb is disciple. And you're going to do that by baptizing and teaching. That's how you make disciples. It's very simple. Now, he didn't do this in a vacuum. He did this after discipling his disciples for three years, he discipled them, baptizing and teaching. Okay. Now, there's two things uh, going on here. One is that information about what is true is being transmitted. But the second thing that's invisible to us is that the Holy Spirit is doing the transforming, bringing faith and informing faith on what to believe about the promises of God and how to act according to God's will, which is called the law of God for Christians, the third use of the law, if you want to get theological. But as you're going, disciple all nations, baptizing and teaching. Is that all? You don't know what I want you to answer for that one, do you? No. <laughs> that is all. And it's, it's complex and complete because there is a lot to teach about life and how that life is connected to God. And that's all. That's what the church has. It, these words of Matthew 28 have been called the church's marching orders. And in, in various hist times in the last 20 centuries, the church has either done a great job of it or a not so great job. But in individual situations, you and I are grateful that we were discipled, that we were taught, that we were baptized into Christ, and that we were outfitted for this life. Although some days it doesn't seem like we have all the equipment we need. Hmm. You know, 
okay. Now immediately my mind, which works associatively, goes to Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. But I'm not going to study that now. So Jesus commands disciple. You do not have a choice. Uh, I'll disciple if I am better educated. Or I'll disciple if um, we have time. <laughs> there were times in our children's life when at 6.30 they need to rush off to a meeting back at school. Dad, can you hurry up? I've got to go. <laughs> well, give me two minutes. <laughs> it was very hard in those days when the teenagers ruled the roost. No, they did not. But they sure created a great influence. What is discipleship? Can you answer that question? Jeez. A lot of questions, don't I? What is discipleship? Teaching. It's teaching. Teaching. Yes, teaching. You are absolutely right. It's teaching by word and by example. Hmm. What does it mean to disciple? You're going to give me the same answer, I think. It also includes what I believe it was Judy mentioned recently, that it, uh, correction, discipline. Mm -hmm. We think of discipline as going with uh, discipline in our children. I'm going to have a problem, pardon my interruption, about uh, the man who cuts our grass is out there with the weed eater. Let me know if the noise gets too loud. I tend to want to let him go, but... Um, we can't hear him. Okay. Let me know if it becomes intrusive on our audio. What does it mean to disciple? To teach by example and by word and to make correction when necessary. That takes courage. What are we actually doing when we make disciples? We're teaching. Yes. We're duplicating ourselves. Ah. That's good. Yes. There's a part of me I want to copy and give to my children and my children's children. And there's a part of me that I don't want to pass on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Do as I do. Not as I say, that won't work. That won't work in any society. Did I mix that up? <laughs> do as I say and not as I do is what I meant to say. So there's another question hidden behind this one. Who is actually making disciples when we teach? God is. God isn't doing the work. He works in the hearts of believers. First of all, to bring them to faith. Mm -hmm. And second, it is his Holy Spirit that is doing it. I think we, we who are pastors sometimes think a little bit too much of ourselves and our ability to teach accurately and forcefully and completely and, and to use the word in, in an articulate way. We, <laughs> but we forget that it is only the Lord's Spirit that can do the changing. He uses us. That's a gladness. So who benefits when we make disciples? We, we the people. Yeah. I think God benefits. Who does? Chris? God. He benefits. Yeah. Well, he gets the glory. And there's, the, yeah. The person who was made a disciple certainly benefits. Yes. Regarding salvation. Expand and, that idea. Well, um, I mean, um, there are going to be another one that's going to join us in heaven after um, the end of our life. And, and also they benefit from forgiveness of sins and they benefit uh, in the resurrection. Who else um, benefits? Right. Uh, the world and neighborhood around us. How so? Um, more people are... Uh, are probably caring uh, instead of, um, I guess, I want to say being ugly. <laughs> That's the only word I can think of right now, I guess, again, because of 
the week we've just had. Um, yeah, well, there's a, there is a salt and a light which we are to the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't say that, Jesus did. Correct. Okay. But, but just showing kindness and, and showing caring. Uh -huh. Two can be two very simple things um, that certainly means a whole lot to somebody. It really does. There are things that you can do that have lasting benefit to the world and to society. You don't have to make big waves. Just please make some waves. <laughs> what is discipleship? Why make disciples? I haven't told you anything yet. All, all questions today. <laughs> well, the party is always better when you have more people with you. <laughs> I like the, the party. <laughs> well, the party in heaven we're going to have would be a lot more fun if we had more people going with us. <laughs> there, there is joy, not only in, in the of the angels in heaven when one person repents, but there is joy when a new person comes to faith in Jesus. Oh, yes, there is. And I speak personally again, if you don't mind. There was a, a man and his wife who came to our church in 1981. And she was very pregnant, and they were looking for a church to baptize their baby. She was raised Catholic, and he was raised Lutheran, and they had both had fallen away from regular worship. And now they had come to us from Stuart. Well, to make a long story short, he's a pastor in Missouri. Wow. And a great friend. And they have raised two children in the faith, and they have grandchildren that are being raised in the faith. Amen. Just because they came, and to uh, some extent, I discipled him. Mm -hmm. He was a Lutheran, but he attended the class when his wife took catechism. And she was discipled there and became supportive of him in many ways as he went to seminary at the, uh, in the 80s. And, and he, I, think, I think our young people that are going through confirmation now, some of them, or even our young children who are in our Christian day school, which is a wonderful outreach, but many of their parents were seeing generations of, of these young parents that have not had any um, teaching, uh, uh, Christian teaching. And so all along, they are going home and teaching their parents or they're bringing them to church and they're bringing them to baptism and confirmation. Martha is bringing the parents in with the children and they are both learning at the same time again. So those are all wonderful ways that uh, we're making disciples and uh, reaching out. So why make disciples? Why? Because we're being obedient to what Christ has commanded us. That's, that's the answer, isn't it? Because he didn't say, if you feel like it. So the duty of the church, the business of the church, is to carry on what he has taught. Are you hearing that, uh, the noise of that? Uh, uh, it's not bothersome. It's not uh, bothersome. Okay. Thank you. Why make disciples? Why make disciples? Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. I left out a word. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let me emphasize, we make disciples because of this problem of people living unto themselves. There is a great sin of self-worship, uh, living for me, and mm -hmm. I am an, afflicted with that. And I think you will admit to that, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. You were talking about obedience before. Mm -hmm. God's way is the right way. <laughs> yes, absolutely. They which live, we're living, and we're living right. with Christ. But it is possible to still live for yourself. 
How does that manifest itself? How does that show if you're living for yourself and not for others? You don't give, you don't serve. You don't give. You sometimes can be a pretty, a pretty lonesome person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With all, with all your riches and uh, things. Yes, there's a parable about that. Why make mm -hmm. disciples? Now, I'm going to list three problems. They aren't the only problems. <clears throat> the first problem we've just identified. Me first. <laughs> True. That's the sin of self. And it, and it, and it goes on and on and on. Men and women and children living unto themselves. The me first generation. You may have heard that expression. There is another problem. And I call these people minimalists. Minimalists. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Believers who do just enough or know just enough to get by. Hmm. Now, let me understand what I'm saying here. Do just enough. Well, I go to church at least once a month. Well, I missed last month, but that's okay. Um, I know John 3.16, uh, Jesus is my savior. He is, um, he forgives me my sins. That's that's enough. I certainly don't need to know anything else. And I'm, I'm getting by. And at the end of my life, um, I get to go to heaven. You, wow. see why, you see why I call these people minimalists? Mm -hmm. Pastor, I'm afraid I'm a minimalist. I don't think so. You're in three Bible studies. No, four. <laughs> <laughs> you have the record. <laughs> or you know, listen, yes. if if you are also applying what you are learning to the extent that you are able and to the extent you understand, then I I'm not going to fault you. Mm -hmm. I'm only in one Bible study, this one. Yes. <laughs> and one, once a month, I'm in a Bible study <laughs> with my my brothers, fellow pastors. We yeah. we meet on Zoom now. We meet next Tuesday. Oh. Pastors have been getting together in circuits. Um, what's the other word for it? I can't think of it now. Uh, to uh, to learn and to apply. Yeah. And to ask questions, and to look for answers. We do mm -hmm. not live alone. Most of us. So those are the minimalists, and it is a problem because of the need for making them disciples. So who defines just enough or no just enough? You do. Makes that decision if they're already... Uh part of the uh, believing only in themselves. When Christ should do it. Well, there is no, there is no enough. There is no, there is no limit. <laughs> unless you say, well, I now know Genesis through Revelation perfectly, and I'm applying it very well to my life and to life, to the lives of others. I think that you would be in, you would be a, a very unique person. Hmm. So just enough, you're right, is defined by the person who says, I know enough. Now, I don't know how, I used to ask the question when I was young, before I went to seminary, I asked, asked the question, how do you get, how do you get more people into Bible study? 
Pastor never answered my question, partly because I think he was struggling with the same question. So let me go on to the next problem. The next problem. Kindergarten Christians, and it's related to the minimalists. You know who the kindergarten Christians are? <laughs> Immature, poorly trained in the basic Christi uh, teachings of Christianity. Oh. <clears throat> now, I don't talk about fault. Fault is a bad word in this context. Uh, once I am of age, I can seek out places where I can get more more discipling, more teaching. I'm not inert. I can be moved. Okay, that's a, that's the answer to the question is that we have these three problems. So I want someone to read Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Judy, would you start us off? Uh, yeah, only for some reason today, um, your picture is obst obstructing part of my 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 screen here. Oh, so, it is, huh? The pictures are wider on the side today, so. I yes, wonder why that. I have is. that problem too. Okay. Um, I can start. It's just the first two sentences. So yeah, maybe actually, you it's only taking off a letter or two. You see the word "you." For for though by uh, Hebrews, for though by this time, something ought to be teachers. You ought to be. You ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach, teach you again. you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Thank you. Now, uh, did taking the, the thumbnail shots of the of you people off the screen help you? Um, you can see all the words now. No. It didn't come off. Mine's still on. Yeah, it just it's just it's just bringing up the name or the picture of just somebody else, and at least for me, it's still obstructing. We seem to be wider today instead of narrower on the side. Uh, I'm going to have to keep that in mind when I make the slides. On the left -hand side. Okay, what do you see now? Do you see um, the it's whole word? Thing. I think because you have that column with the key, like Christine said on the other side, yeah. it's moved all your print over to the right further. I yeah. can see it fine. I'll, I'll <clears throat> see it fine now. Yeah, mine is fine also. I can see the whole thing. Okay, I can do that with the screen. I, All right. All right. I would That's play fine. it wrong, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose everybody. Yeah, All right. All right. Well, After almost we're at the end of our hour. So we're actually, today, we're not solving any problems. We're uh, in this introductory uh, time together. I am outlining the problem, and I am outlining uh, these questions about the why of discipling and what is discipleship. Why make disciples? I'm going to take this passage and pluck out from it some pertinent phrases. Number one, you ought to be teachers. Number two, you need someone to teach you. Number three, you need milk, not solid food. You are unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. I would like to be feeding you solid food, but the writer to the Hebrews is saying to this congregation, wherever it is and whoever it is, you ought to be teachers, but now you need someone to teach you. You need milk instead of solid food. And solid food is for the mature. Solid food, solid food is for those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice 
to distinguish good from evil. So you're unskilled in right from wrong. So this is the problem all over the church today, but not everyone has this problem. I think you would like to be mature Christians. Mm -hmm. Yes. And some of you are because you have been in the word for, for decades. Why make disciples? Not only because Jesus commanded us to make disciples, but because we love him who died and rose for us. And because we love others as he loved us. And because we long to be mature in the faith we believe. Wouldn't you say yay and amen to those? Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You would say, I want to be this. I want to continue to learn. To be discipled. To say to the Lord, come and, and, and come alongside of me when I read the Bible. And let your Holy Spirit abide with me because I want to be mature in the faith. So there's one word before us today, and that is the word discipleship. 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 And I'm going to end there because it says 56 minutes and 55 seconds. And I'll, I'll do the, I'll, un, I'll unshare. That went fast to me. Yes, we're still Thank recording. Thank you for teaching us discipleship, Pastor. Oh, there's more to come. There's more to come. All we've done today is to say, what is discipleship and why? And then we're going into the scriptures more and more to see evidence of it, of Jesus discipling the, the, the disciples. Why were they called disciples? And, uh, and how it applies to our current time. Okay. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we are not there yet. We have not arrived at full maturity. We have not shown the fruits of our faith in all the areas of our lives. And we have, we have a lot of correction that we need by you. We need what your word says to our hearts. Not only the law which has convicted us, but also the promise that you will not leave us or forsake us and that in abiding with us, as we abide in your word, we will be further discipled to be followers of Jesus, your son, and to show our faith in the places of our lives where it is not now showing. Lord God, we confess our need for your help, and we attach our faith to your promise to be our helper. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit are one God now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.